Good evening and a very warm welcome to St. Albans Cathedral um, in person and online as we continue through this Holy Week on the theme of journey tonight, the journey companions of the way with our speaker, Bishop Christine Hardman. We begin this evening on page 17 of the Orders of Service. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Holy and eternal God, grant us courage to journey with Christ to the cross. Keep us faithful as we watch and wait and open our hearts and minds to your truth. Amen. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So far during this Holy Week, I've been reflecting on the whole notion of journey, the journey we are making to the cross this week, 
and the journey of our lives and our faith. On Monday, I explored setting out on a journey, saying yes to the doors God opens. Yesterday, I explored the very different experience of being lost. Tonight, I want to reflect on the companions we find on the way as we seek to follow Jesus. When I was an archdeacon in Southwark Diocese, I began most days at morning prayer at Southwark Cathedral. The notion of journey, of pilgrimage, is part of the DNA of Southwark Cathedral. In the Middle Ages, pilgrims, uh, pilgrimages to Canterbury began in St. Mary Overy in Southwark, which is now Southwark Cathedral. But interestingly, the most famous pilgrimage of all, the pilgrimage of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, did not begin in church. They set off from a pub down the road called the Tabard Inn. Sadly, the Tabard was demolished in the 19th century, but the pub next door, the George Inn, is still there. And I walked past it every morning as I walked down Borough High Street to my office a few doors along. Some journeys, like Gerard Hughes' walk to Jerusalem, are made alone. But many, as described in Canterbury Tales, are made with a band of people, most probably unknown to each other at the beginning, who make the pilgrimage or journey together. When my husband and I made our journey across the States, we set out with just the two of us. Being a couple is quite different from making a journey alone, but it's not part of being part of a group. The route we took across the States is known as the Transit America bike route. The western end is at Astoria in Oregon, the oldest white settlement west of the Rockies, established for fur trading, and the eastern end is at Yorktown, Virginia, where the Brits were finally vanquished in 1776. The route was established in 1976 to celebrate the bicentennial of American independence. About half the people doing this route start in the east, and the other half start in the west. We started in the west at Astoria. What this means is that in our early first days, we met a lot of cyclists who had come from the east and were very nearly at the end of their journey. Some of those we spoke to were hating every minute of it. They could not wait to finish. It was striking that nearly all those who felt like that were cycling alone. Had we stayed, my husband and I, just being the two of us, I'm not quite sure how that would have worked out. But we didn't. As the days went past, we began accumulating fellow traveling companions along the way. A couple from Connecticut, Rick, retired American military, and his wife Mary Ellen, a lawyer. She was making the trip to celebrate her recovery from breast cancer. Another Rick, a retired banker from Wisconsin who was an avid fisherman and hunter and devout Roman Catholic. Charlie and Sue on a tandem, Mormons from Ohio. Bob and Maggie also on a tandem, teachers from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We were a motley bunch. Chaucer would have recognized the similarities. We had nothing in common except making this rather crazy journey across America on a bike. We didn't cycle much together during the day, but began to want to share each other's company. So we would agree to meet up each no at each night's destination, sometimes in the cheapest motel we could find, sometimes camping. We would share a meal together at the end of the day sharing our stories, 
celebrating achievements, often comforting one another and offering support when things had gone wrong. To find companions for the journey is a precious gift. And you do find them. You don't choose them. They become companions for the simple reason they are fellow travelers on the journey. Archbishop Stephen Cottrell writes about this in his reflection on what he calls his very long walk, the pilgrimage he made to Santiago de Compostela. He wrote this, I learned that you cannot choose your fellow travelers or your companions on the road. If you are walking in the mountains in northern Spain and someone is alongside you, then unless you choose to stop or run ahead, then they are your companions for the day. And when you find a bed for the night in one of the little pilgrimage hostels, then the person on the bunk bed below or above you and all those around you are your neighbours, whether you like it or not. And you must decide whether the cacophony of snoring that strikes up every night and to which you doubtless contribute when you fall asleep yourself is going to drive you mad or bolster up your prayer. The very first Christians learned that we are called to a journey and a journey in company to follow Christ and to walk in his way. Indeed, the first Christians were called followers of the way. You don't choose your fellow travelers, creating a club of the like-minded. This is something the church needs to take seriously at the moment. We are brothers and sisters and fellow companions, and we can't choose who is in and who is out. People are sometimes surprised that I'm a huge fan of St. Paul. The main reason for this is that despite his undoubted foibles, the theological insights he has given us are profound. And one of the most profound insights of St. Paul is our need of one another. That we are called together as the body of Christ. Many years ago in the late 80s, I had the privilege of spending time with the late Bishop Sion Goodridge, who at that time, before becoming the Bishop of the Windward Isles, was the principal of the Simon of Cyrene Theological Institute. The Institute was formed to provide training and leadership development for minority ethnic Anglicans. Bishop Sion said this, there are two kinds of people in this world, those who see difference as a problem and those who see difference as a gift. He was referring to the evil of racism, but the principle both includes and goes far beyond that and includes the myriad ways in which we categorize people as being like us or not like us. St. Paul saw that difference is a gift and we need one another, most especially when we bring our difference. There is that powerful image of the body of Christ in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. Paul was writing to a church uh, that included a lot of difference. I think the church in Corinth gets a bit of an unfair bad name known as those quarrelsome Corinthians. Um, they quarreled because there were differences, real differences between them. They had not become a club of the like-minded. They had not split off into factions. Paul writing to them describes the church as a unity, as being one body, but a body made up of different parts, just like the human body. The body needs its different parts, if the whole body were an eye, Paul says, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? And so each part needs the other. The eye cannot say to the hand, 
I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Paul charged those early Corinthians, you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Paul saw difference as a gift and saw that each one of us brings our own unique selves with our unique gifts into the whole. In the journey of our lives and our faith, we will have had numerous companions on the way. Some may have been companions only for a short while, and we may not even have known their name. Some will have been a part of our journey for a longer time, and others may be companions that are lifelong. Whether briefly or over the years, we have been enriched by our fellow travelers and companions and been blessed by them. It's perhaps less obvious to us, but we will have blessed them by our companionship. At the heart of the Christian journey, we have the pattern set by Jesus of traveling together on the way. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus called 12 different people to follow him and to accompany him. Bluntly, it's clear that he didn't call the most gifted people to be around him, but 12 rather ordinary and flawed men. And beyond these 12 disciples, there were a number of courageous women who I imagine challenged the conventions of the time by journeying with Jesus too. As we seek to follow Jesus, most of us are called to travel in company with our sisters and our brothers, not into journeying alone. And so it is for the journey of faith we make this Holy Week. From tomorrow, the journey gets more intense as we recall the Last Supper and then Jesus' agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then together, we come to the foot of the cross on Good Friday. In the physical journeys I have made, and in my journey of faith and life, some words of T.S. Eliot have meant a great deal to me. But it is at the foot of the cross that I have found them to be most profoundly true. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. The prayer for our journey this Holy Week by the Trappist monk Thomas Merton. My Lord, I, my Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever near me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone.
the Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. And may the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. O oh God, make speed to save us. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up even to my neck. I have grown weary with crying, my throat is raw. My eyes have failed from looking so long for my God. Those who would destroy me are mighty. My enemies accuse me falsely. Must I now give back what I never stole? Let 
not those who hope in you be put to shame through me, Lord God of hosts. Let not those who seek you be disgraced because of me, O God of Israel. I'm a stranger to my kindred, an alien to my mother's children. I humbled myself with fasting, but that was turned to my reproach. Those who sit at the gate murmur against me. And the drunkards make songs about me. Answer me, O God, in the abundance of your mercy. And with your sure salvation. Let not the water flood drown me, neither the deep swallow me up. Let not the pit shut its mouth upon me. not your face from your servant. Be swift to answer me, for I am in trouble. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, Lord God of truth. Keep me as the apple of an eye. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Now, Lord, you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Christ, Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we stand at the foot of the cross of your Son, help us to see and know your love for us so that in humility, love, and joy, we may place at his feet all that we have and all that we are, through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. In peace we will lie down and sleep. Abide with us, Lord Jesus. As the night watch looks for the morning. 
come with the dawning of the day. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen.